tower at Jones Beach. Uh, I mentioned on the first program that this was a sort of a little travel log, and I'm going to have to wind this up in just a half an hour. There's a great deal to do, and um, I accomplished uh, two things, getting the sky in and waiting for the paint to set a little bit, and to put the clouds, and then to proceed further on to the, uh, the, the, the final, you know, resolving of this whole thing, the placement of it. Even though this is on the water's edge, uh, not the water's edge, but it's right there, the ocean is just behind this tower. Just past those little line of trees back there lies the Atlantic Ocean. Not visible from this particular vantage point, but your imagination will, uh, will be well served if you can picture for a moment that there is a blue line of uh, horizon, which is the, um, which is that uh, amazing body of water between us and France, uh, or us and Africa, whichever way you please. Anyway, here, are the, here is the way I'm going to, the, the sky has been done, paint, uh, put on with a palette knife and then smoothed with a brush, and now comes the application of the clouds. Uh, this is, I'm doing this with a pure white out of, the, um, out of the tube, which is something that I have said to not do before, but it would seem to me that it looks to me as though these clouds are pretty well Pretty white. There is very the, the the time of day does not give me any feeling that this might be some in the afternoon clouds because uh, they turn peachy in the afternoon. I'm putting this on over so somewhat wet paint, and the more you make the clouds subtle, the better. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, the tops of the clouds are what get the white, and then because it blends somewhat into the uh, into the blue of the sky. You can get the wispiness of clouds. The, uh, the anatomy of a cloud is as important as the anatomy of a flower or of the human face. And um, if, you, um, if you observe it and then do your own interpretation, usually a cloud painting is very successful. It gives you a feeling of space and air and that you are, in fact, out of door or looking at something that is really out of doors, uh, even though the cloudless sky is something that we all hope for. When we get in the car and go to Jones Beach, we don't want to see uh, any evidence so that possibly there is some weather coming. So a cloudless day is what we're after. But in painting, a cloudy, a day with clouds, not a cloudy day, but a, a day with clouds is what is interesting to the painter. Now you can see I'm only painting the tops of these. Uh, certainly that should be uh, visible and comprehensible to anybody who's watching me. I keep going back for fresh paint all the time uh, because the, uh, the uh, texture of the paint is, is, is the interest that is created by oil painting. You do not find this in watercolor. Watercolor is, re relies upon washes and a very sort of what I call a juicy look to it. But the oil painting, um, uh, intrigue is the fact that there is this texture right here, this one, this being ca uh, shadow is being cast on it. And some people do don't like to use them. Uh, to me, uh, I always look for the brush strokes in a painting. Uh, you don't find those by doing them with a house brush. I can guarantee that. And here, with a, with a sort of a real, a real bonanza of clouds, and way up here there are some wispy ones sort of playing around in the, um, in the upper atmosphere, and they don't have any tops to them. They're just sort of wispy little, little arrangements, and um, those can be interpreted uh, uh, with a certain freedom. Um, I'm, I'm a very real, realist painter, but uh, there are times when I feel that you have to uh, do some interpretation as well. And this is when it's so amorphous and so indistinct as these wispy clouds up here that you can, in fact, 
uh, just sort of, uh, um, well, dab them on and then blend them in. And if the paint is the right texture in the background, which is what it is now, it will be very cooperative and it will look just about as wispy as you want it to. And you can see that you don't need very much more than that. It's a suggestion. It is, uh, it is the ultimate in interpretation. Then we have here the most subtle of all things, which is um, I'm going to take a little bit of ultramarine blue and a touch of some umber, and I'm going to attempt to, to make a um, the lower part of the cloud shadow. This is a sort of a really the most subtle thing that you can possibly attempt to do. It is not gray. It is also in the blue tones. And underneath here, uh, you uh, barely touch the canvas with some of these darker tones to give the cloud its uh, its anatomy to give the cloud its uh, understanding that this is, in fact, a form. It's going to be gone soon, and it doesn't last very long, and what it is is really vapor. So uh, anything darker than this uh, is, going to, uh, is going to be, first of all, not believable, and secondly, somewhat amateurish. So the subtlety of these cloud shadows are important. Uh, if you get it too dark, you dilute it with white. Uh, if you get it, uh, if you get it too gray, you can change that by adding some blue. But it is the most, uh, the most subtle of approaches. Uh, some of them have a little bit more tone underneath them. And here, once again, there is a, uh, a rather um, impressive kind of interpretation that is needed here. The center part, the center part of the cloud, sort of, you leave it alone. And uh, uh, this is one really sort of a great fun, even even though that we're supposed to be doing the tower, it is also a, uh, a double whammy. We're getting a cloud study uh, information here, and as and as I've proceeded, the clouds have now changed shape. They've also changed placement, and that's why you have to work really very quickly when you're out there. Uh, to when you're working out of doors, the sky color would. Uh, dry quicker than it does here in the studio. Therefore, you probably would be able to get to the painting of the clouds almost immediately. But um, I had to wait for a little bit uh, for, the, um, for the setting of the paint. So here we have, I think that, uh, that if I need to refine this a little bit later as the program continues, but I need to get on to the, um, this is a little bit dark. As I look in the monitor, this particular shadow is a little bit dark. And this is what you do. You wipe your brush, and then you go back to the canvas, and you, uh, you uh, get rid of the, uh, what appears to me to be a slight slightly dark here. I need to I need to make that a little bit more subtle. And that's what I say. When you do the deliberate strokes and you're working from life, you are able to get the subtleties, which are all important in realist painting. Get rid of some of these, um, these darker spots. I think that probably works far better. Glad I caught it in time. Uh, I'm going to now start to work uh, with, a, with a brush. Uh, in my fav very favorite color of all time, which is the sap green, to do these wonderful white pines. These white pines have survived hurricanes of major proportions uh, on this spit of land out here. And uh, there they are, uh, remarkably wonderful shaped trees. Uh, uh, that um, uh, that are all part of this uh, of this beautifully landscaped thing. I mean, I tell you, if the, if the Disney people would be able to just sort of take a look at what has happened to these areas here on Long Island, maybe we would probably. Um, uh, I might be a little bit less critical. I find sometimes the the fake look about some of the Disney theme parks. Uh, have missed an awful lot of uh, of wonderful stuff if they don't sort of. Oh, tap into the uh, the amazing thing that happens to nature when you leave it alone. Uh, these trees were planted a very long time ago, and they have survived the uh, the uh, the weather st conditions here and have gotten better. They're a little bit windblown. They're storm tossed, uh, but uh, still very nicely taken care of, of course, by the parks department. We live in an amazing place here, where the uh, the parks are ours. We can drive out there free of charge, a couple of cents on the on the on the you know, on the bridge, and then maybe a couple of bucks for parking. But look what you get. Uh, look, look at the, uh, and the beach, of course, is absolutely uh, world famous and renowned and wonderful to go to. Uh, if you don't, if you don't mind the huge bunch of people, but if you've got any sense at all, you'll just walk a little bit down the beach, go to where it's a little, a little less inhabited, uh, less full of uh, radio uh, music, and uh, you'll find yourself in uh, well, some version of Seventh Heaven, I think. 
Uh, Jones Beach was one of the first places that I was taken to when I got to this country, and I thought, well, my parents did right. They brought me to the right place. This is all sap green, a touch of umber for the darker parts underneath, and then when the darker parts are put in, some of the paler branches will be superimposed over them in the layered uh, technique that I keep talking about. And uh, you'll find I'm going to use, use a little bit of the marache medium and go clear on down to the tops of the hedges uh, that are the, uh, the, the uh, approach to the tower. So this is all very dark, very dramatic, and um, makes for an interesting uh, composition, just practically all made for you. You don't have to invent anything here. This is all done for you with the landscape as it is. If you were to go out here and paint, uh, you would probably have to park your car someplace in one of the lots and then uh, take your material with you uh, uh, down many paths and to try to you know, set yourself up. I think that the Parks Department would probably be perfectly cooperative with you. Uh, I mean, I'm assuming they are always with me, but, uh, and I think painters and people who want to paint the landscape are always very well received by the public and by the officials as well. If you promise that you won't throw dirty turpentine cloths all over the place or leave a mess of trash around, which of course we painters that, that respect the landscape are not going to do. I, um, I always manage to remove whatever rocks I've used as a pallet or whatever piece of driftwood I've found on the beach. I take it with me because I suppose I just can't imagine uh, anybody stepping on a piece of driftwood full of wet oil paint. <laughs> uh, that, that would be something of a nightmare. Anyway, the interpretation of these trees gives you some idea of the, uh, of the intense dramatic uh, quality that takes place out here. And there is a little meadow back here, uh, not meadow, it's a, little, it's a little rise in the land that I see uh, going sort of, uh, sort of in the distance there, and that'll tell you that something is happening beyond this bunch of, of pines. And uh, just a detail that has to be suggested. Speaking of suggestive paintings, and by that I don't mean rude paintings, I mean paintings that just merely suggest something. The tower, for instance, uh, there, the, the mistake would be to try to interpret that as brick, and by painting the brick uh, in, in detail, uh, you, uh, I believe, would understand immediately that this is a brick tower. There is no need to interpret maybe a dot here and there, which I might do later. But what I'm going to do now is to just show you the little branches from these pines that are catching the sun and give you the anatomy of this tree with virtually no effort whatsoever. Um, not that there isn't any effort, but observation is what is needed. These little, these little fingers of, of, of white pine are caught by the sunshine in the deep shadow of the trees. And um, you, can, you can see that uh, there is very, not much more is needed to tell you about the type of tree that this is. I think that anybody who sees this is going to understand that these are, in fact, pine trees. They may not know that they're white pine, but they will know that they are pine trees just by introducing these little, um, these uh, what I call fingers, these little pointy fingers of, of, of branches. Over here, they're virtually non-existent. You can't tell them over here. They, the light, they don't catch the light very well over there. Now, the lower part of this, um, of this tower, of course, is in this Ohio limestone, which I'm mixing with a touch of um, uh, touch of the white, uh, the base, of course, is white, and uh, some uh, some uh, raw um, uh, uh, raw umber. Burnt umber is a is a very intense color. I'm painting over that car that I did the first time, just to show you that there was a road up there, and um, the base of this is white, a touch of black, and some of the uh, uh, raw umber. Uh, to give you that color, and I'm going to put the color on dark to begin with because I have to do a little bit of, inter of interpretation on top of that to give you the texture of that limestone. Um, uh, it doesn't have to be uh, absolutely uh, botanically or, or even uh, uh, accurate in as far as building materials is concerned, but it ought to have a suggestion of what this is all made of down here. Um, there's a runner running across the screen. So this place is used to great advantage by all kinds, and uh, the summertime is approaching. This is a good time to do this painting to let you know once again that uh, happy lazy days and frisbee days and suntanning days and picnics in the sand are just around the corner after this disastrously difficult winter. 
Uh, I don't know whether or not anybody here feels that that winter was one of a kind and can remain one of a kind. I don't expect that anybody would like to see that sort of thing come back again. It was, uh, it was actually paralyzing for an awful lot of things, business as well as um, activity. And um, I painted a couple of blizzard scenes down there in Virginia and did some, uh, some rather interesting snow scenes, but after a while, enough is enough. Okay, the hedges. Uh, before, before I get a signal that we have to break, the tops of the hedges are an interesting color. They haven't turned green yet. Uh, they will. In a matter of weeks, the tops of these hedges are going to probably be brilliant yellow-green, which happens when privet hedge does begin to blossom. But right now, because of this time of year, they are just sort of, well, sort of homely, uh, homely tone. But it gives a nice color scheme to this otherwise. A very uh, simple a color schemed painting. The scheme of this painting is, of course, blue, the rose of the tower, and the brilliant yellow green of the lawn that leads up to the tower. But I'm going to interpret these bushes for you in the time of year that it is. No fakery here, no making it up. I think that uh, everybody deserves to know that at uh, this time of year, this is what happens. And there's a very uh, sort of a misty look about these uh, about these bushes that are going to turn uh, different in, in a very short period of time. Uh, I find that uh, when you do this kind of thing, you can, uh, you can tell uh, a great deal more than just the place. You can tell the time of year, and you can tell the time of day. I've talked about this once before. So, with these bushes getting put in uh, at a nice rapid place, uh, pace, I'm going to take a break for just a second. Uh, the camera needs to do something. I'm all right, but the camera needs work. So, but I'll see you in a minute. Here we are back again, and uh, things seem, seem to be winding down for the last part <clears throat> of part two of this study of the Jones Beach Tower. Obviously, the front, the foreground is going to be what they call a piece of cake because it is just an uninterrupted, wonderful field of green, which is going to give a, a, a dramatic quality, even though it see, appears to be a sort of a nothing thing. It's going to be definitely a something thing because uh, in, uh, I have always found that uh, dramatic uh, uses of color uh, are what is intriguing, what makes a painting easy to live with. If you have something which is a sort of a little bit wimpy and it doesn't really come to grips with anything, uh, you find yourself, something's missing. It's like, uh, it's like a, a story without a punchline. And so, in, in my opinion, great fields of color are the punchline uh, to, um, uh, to a good story. And here I have, uh, I'm working with some umber and some of the, uh, some of the, uh, I'm staying away from green because there's almost no green at all in these bushes at this point. Uh, however, as I said uh, just a moment ago, that ain't for long. Um, I remember, uh, and I don't know why this pops into my mind right now, but um, when I said the shadowy figure that is signaling me two minutes left, that means that I'm kind of, in, in a way, letting everybody in on what's happening here in this studio, because I'm actually talking to, uh, not just to myself, but to, and to, not to a little red light on the camera, but I'm talking to th three other people, because that's the only humans in the room. And uh, when, when the little shadowy figure gives me that signal, it sort of lets you in on what's happening 
happening here, and it's very much like when David Letterman uh, sort of stepped away from his desk many years ago and, and told the camera person to follow him into the dressing rooms, and there was something going on in there that he thought was funny and that he wanted everybody to see. And it was such a shock that people suddenly realized, oh, that's great fun to see what's happening, not just in the setup and the, and the way everything is supposed to look and the way everybody has struggled to make it look exactly right and to go a little bit behind the scenes, uh, to me, is somewhat interesting. And uh, because uh, uh, some people have said to me, how do you know uh, when you're supposed to start to hurry and how do you know when it's over? You never look at a watch. And so the explanation is right today. Uh, it's called the shadowy figure with the fingers in uh, telling me that two minutes are here and that that's all we have left. So uh, in case anybody wonders about my uh, innate and incredible ability to be able to tell the time, it's not me at all. It's the shadowy figure. As like the grassy knoll. I think we could probably use that as a password. And um, the, uh, the program comes to an end so quickly many times because I really do get involved with details. And the details are going to be right now with this uh, pre-mixed color of white, a touch of yellow, a little touch of, and I'm going to the tower. Uh, in case the close-up people are wondering where I'm going next, um, there is always the need for people to know what I'm going to be doing next on this live show, because none of this is rehearsed. Sometimes we wish it were, but it never is. And the details are going to be here in this Indiana, in this Ohio limestone structure, which has a lot of wonderful details, and I'm only going to make a slight suggestion of what they are. Uh, the uh, the uh, arrangement of the brick is, 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 is is interesting. The use of, uh, of different tones of brick is, is you know, quite fascinating. And, um, and I have to be able to uh, tell you that if you're there, uh, to interpret this uh, very slightly, just a suggestion here, and then, then, then maybe even unpaint it. But we have to know that these details are there and that, this, that the top of this uh, particular tower uh, or column arrangement is there. And then there's another one here. Uh, and this is, this is by no means insinuating that this is the finished painting, but uh, this is what you're going to run into if you're out there working on these things. If you're out there d d discovering all this, the details are going to be somewhat important, but they can be also minimized. Uh, there are some darker lines, but some lighter lines here. So let me just see whether or not. And then there's this pale area. It looks very much like marble to me, this one right in here. And uh, that probably needs to have a little bit paler co color to it, which is, uh, which is just going to uh, pull some, some pale tone across here because people are going to Somebody is going to say uh, that's absolutely correct. Uh, we, I am, after all, an interpreter of the of the truth, and the truth is that these details are important in the final in the final production of these of these studies. Uh, just a few of lines, not too dark, but a few of these lines that are going to be running across here, just to tell you that um, th this is the architectural detail. Mr. Mr. Moses, in whatever part of the world or cosmic system he is, is going to be glad that I'm paying attention to the fact that he probably insisted, drove everybody crazy to get these details, and they are now being paid attention to and observed with a great deal of, um, of interest. Uh, I'm sure that the, uh, the designs and the architectural plans for this are somewhere in the, uh, in the state of New York uh, Parks Department uh, archives, and uh, they, uh, they um, Mr. Moses, you're welcome. If you like what I'm doing, that's just fine. Uh, here we go with the last uh, with the last general attempt. All of this would have to be refined much more. But the uh, but the this great big wonderful dramatic uh, use of green in the foreground. Uh, probably uh, I can probably say to you uh, that uh, it is a mixture, and I should probably put this on with my palette knife. But there's no harm in seeing brush strokes taking place. Uh, this is a, a very large area, and it's not. Not all one color all mixed up because lawns, even though no matter how much poison the chem doctor spreads on lawns, lawns have a tendency to be in different patches of color here and there. And we are not painting a golf course here. We're painting a, uh, um, a nicely maintained and planted uh, area of grass that may or may not have other uh, foreign bodies in it, such as weeds and maybe even a touch of um, clover. And so uh, the, uh, the, variegate, the variegated colors are important to do, to be done af if you observe. And uh, fortunately, I, um, I seem to have the ability to observe little things that in the overall picture make a great deal of sense. Um, that 
is going to have to be joined. That little bush there does not get a white line underneath it. It probably needs to, well, that blending is okay. That works sort of. I'll go back to it later if this time. And here the, um, this nice great sweep of, of lawn, or grass or whatever it is, on which you may or may not set up your uh, easel uh, in the distant or re new future, uh, you will find is, um, uh, is to be interpreted with, uh, with deliberate strokes. Um, the uh, the uh, story of Mr. Jones, if I may go back to, to that for just a moment, being what he was, and the first program told you pretty much about his activities and how he made the money to acquire all this uh, land, and then <clears throat> through a series over the last 260 odd years have taken place whereby the government finally owned this. Actually, <clears throat> guess who owned them first? Uh, the Indians didn't own them. They were simply borrowing this land, which was the Indian attitude uh, in this country with the um, the Native American Indian that merely used the land on the term that it belonged to itself and that uh, the human being simply borrowed it. Um, the attitude about that has somewhat changed uh, over the years. Now we think we own this and the government uh, and the state and whoever uh, does uh, think, thinks they own this land. It's interesting because when you finally when you finally kick off this mortal coil, you don't own anything. Uh, however, the, um, this is government land, nicely entertained. It is a national park. Thank goodness for it. And don't misuse it, use it. Uh, but by golly, uh, let's all make sure that it, um, that it is in such a wonderful condition now and that it remains that way through our efforts as well as through the, the efforts of the um, administration that takes care of this. Uh, once again, we have uh, gone on an interesting tour of Long Island through the, uh, through the uh, courtesy and, um, and uh, cooperation of Cablevision. Uh, your, your Long Island station. We apparently go from tip to toe, the toe being, of course, uh, to the west of us, and the tip being Montauk. Uh, this is me, Pat Windrow. I'm glad you watched. Uh, my son says, don't say I'll see you next time, because you will not see them next time. They may see you the next time. And if you do, I hope that you're interested again to watch this uh, painting from life. Bye-bye. <laughs>